It's been 12 years since Stephen Avery was convicted of murder, three years since the Netflix docu-series Making Murder threw him into the international spotlight, and after all this time, he's still fighting to clear his name. For those very few of you who missed his story, Avery and his nephew, Brendan Dassey, were both convicted in 2007 of murdering Teresa Hallback, and they became the focus of a 10-part documentary which seriously questioned the police investigation and cases against both men. They didn't dress like everybody else. They didn't have education like other people. The Avery family didn't fit into the community. Do we have a body or anything yet? I don't believe so. We have Stephen Avery in custody, though. If convicted, Stephen Avery will spend the rest of his life in prison. We found a key. That key was scrubbed, and his DNA was placed on it. This is really strange. What's going on here? Making a Murderer's first season suggests that officers may have planted some evidence and coerced then 16-year-old Dassey into confessing he helped his uncle rape and murder Hallback. Now in its second season, the series presents a new timeline, interviews with witnesses that seem to point the finger at Dassey's brother Bobby and their stepfather Scott Dadich, arguing they lied in court and tried to erase evidence. And Avery's post-trial lawyer, Kathleen Zellner, is fighting to appeal the conviction thanks to exculpatory evidence not given to the defense and the argument that she believes Avery's original defense attorneys were ineffective. Those original attorneys, Jerry Buting and Dean Strang, joined me recently. Jerry and Dean, great to see you guys again. You know, last time uh, we were all together, all three of us, uh, I was asked to host an event at, I think, the Hancock Center downtown, where there were a couple of thousand people, and it was literally, it was like Lennon and McCartney. Had been, <laughs> I, know, I mean, it was. It was not, I know not you don't quite. like, but it, well, it was quite. Yeah. What's life like? After, you guys have been doing this, but not on national television for years. What's life like after making a murder? It's getting back closer to normal, although there is a new normal, I think. Um, what is the new normal? Still being recognized in airports and around town. A um, lot more letters from prisons. Isn't that a good thing? I mean, you're both, are you being false, not falsely, but overly modest? I mean, that's the goal, to raise yeah, the profile. Yeah, I mean, it, it's uh, because we, we want to continue the, the discussion on, on justice reform that making a murder start. So from that standpoint, it's a good thing. It's, it's kind of weird walking into a bar in a town I've never been, and the bartender says, welcome back, sir. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like they recognize the face, but they're not always sure. Where now everybody where it's knows from. your name exactly. exactly. <laughs> okay, so I watch uh, uh, season one not once but twice. I've almost watched nothing in my life uh, twice. I haven't watched season two, but I've read a lot about it. So if we could just update people a little bit, uh, we know uh, in terms of Brendan Dassey, his appeals have been exhausted in the Supreme Court. So let's talk about Stephen Avery for a minute. Although These, we, you should note that Brendan still has options. What are those options? He, he's never filed a what's called a 97406. What does that mean? conviction motion so after your direct appeal is done you can still come back on a what's called a collateral it's, it used to be state habeas corpus so it's similar to the federal process but it's in the state With what courts. kinds of arguments newly discovered evidence um, and possibly an effective assistance of counsel when you have that and, but you can go back to the state trial court is, is Jerry's point and uh, that that remains open to Brendan. And in Avery, he is in the state court. Kathleen yes. Zellner is, yes. Uh, yes. is uh, attempting to get a new trial here. One of the arguments is this thing about uh, potentially exculpatory evidence, and I say potentially only to be unbiased, seems to me to be totally exculpatory evidence. The, one of the chief prosecution witnesses was Brendan's brother, uh, and uh, some information was found on Brendan's brother's hard drive or CD or something in his computer that was not fully disclosed to you guys in the trials. Is that a fair that's, statement? That's what, what, fair What's statement. on that CD? What's on that hard drive? Uh, a, a bunch of uh, incriminating searches. Um, at a time that only at a time Brendan, when, uh, uh, sorry, uh, uh, at a time when at least Kathleen Zellner alleges only Bobby Dassey would have been home yes. and had access to the computer. And some of these really uh, chilling uh, searches and and also pornographic uh, imagery uh, are awfully like um, what happened eventually to Teresa Halbach. And, and why was this not a basis like this for at least further evidentiary hearings or potentially a new trial? It, it should have been. And, and when she dis she just discovered it, though. And this was not turned over to you. If it wasn't, wasn't made turned over to us. By the prosecution. It wasn't turned over to us. And in fact, we've never actually seen it because mm -hmm. it was only turned over to Kathleen Zellner in, in April. And all we've, we, we've seen what's been written about it and discussed about it. Um, but 
she the she filed it with the court of appeals and then they sent it back for a hearing with the trial court at least we thought there was going to be a hearing about it and the trial court denied the motion said you don't get a hearing um, and so now that is back up in the court of appeals so you know we'll have to see what happens see, one of the other arguments was made by Zellner was a, a case of ineffective counsel against you guys and as I mentioned to you when we talked in the radio you basically said the allegations are accurate is that what did you say well, exactly? Well, certainly some of them are factually. Um, I mean, the the, the factually the that core you didn't do some of the things that she's raising. Yeah. Now, whether that rises to the legal definition of ineffective assistance of counsel, that's what the, a court right. has to decide. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, but in terms, our of, job at this point is simply, to, yeah. if, in effect, to be witnesses. Um, and and you're okay with that? Sure. Yeah. Uh, look, Kathleen Zellner didn't make these rules. Um, and the reality is she's got to play by them. And very often the most acceptable person to blame for an unreliable conviction turns out to be the defense lawyers. And that's, that's the way it is. Okay, that's her job. But you know, I, yesterday I think I was reading a letter that Avery purportedly wrote. I think he did to what was it, In Touch Weekly a couple of weeks. When you hear words like this, uh, apparently a handwritten letter, Dean and Jerry didn't do, do no investigation on this case. If they did, I would not be in prison. They would have the suspect if they did the job. What, what does that feel like? Well, it, it's not right, but it is understandable. This guy's sitting in prison. At, at the time he wrote that letter, he'd been in prison for over 10 years um, on a crime he has always said he didn't commit. And, you know, I... I'm not going to hold that against him. He's venting. He's frustrated. I'd be, if I was innocent and sitting in prison, I can imagine the letters I'd be writing. So is this the end of the story? I know neither of you are Nostradamus, and you say there are some post-trial proceedings that Dassey can get involved in, and obviously Avery's are still, some of them are still pending, but is the, they're both still serving life sentences. They is are. that going to be the end of this thing? Well, I don't know. I mean, uh, there, there's been a, uh, it's fluid. In fact, there, Zellner continues to file motions with new evidence and new arguments because more people are coming forward to her with tips. And so the latest she's filed is she asked to, to test. There were some bones that were found mm. in the quarry and in the gravel pit area off of the Avery property altogether. And at trial, the prosecutor argued that these were not human bones. Um, she's asked to, to test. There's a, a new DNA test, a rapid DNA test now that, that's been accepted by the courts and by the FBI, and in fact was just used in the, the, the fire in California, the campfire, yeah. where it was used to identify 80% of, of the victims. And so what she's argued is, let me test those. If they are in fact human, that strengthens the argument that she was burned somewhere mm -hmm. else, not in Avery's burn pit, and that would be exculpatory evidence. Before I get to the big picture, what you've devoted much of your lives to is criminal justice reform off this true crime effort that virtually everybody in America seems to have watched. Marjorie Egan and I spent a lot of time on the radio railing against the undemocratic atrocity in Wisconsin uh, perpetrated by the Republican legislature when a Democratic governor replaced Scott Walker and a Democratic attorney general replaced the Republican attorney general. Uh, they're limiting their powers in ways that will be challenged in court. That's the bad news. The good news is they're gone. And there was a lot of animus towards Avery in particular here. Is there a possibility that this new team, the Attorney General and the Governor in Wisconsin, could be more sympathetic ears and eyes to this situation? I, I hope so. I really do hope so. And, and if we step away from Stephen Avery or any other specific case, I do think that the, the new Governor in Wisconsin will be open to considering the use inappropriate cases of the executive power of clemency. Which Walker never used once in eight years. Well, right? and, and had announced before he was sworn in that he would not consider clemency. Even though he had the constitutional power to use it, he would never use it. He had a constitutional responsibility, and he's the only governor to never even can, can, uh, create a, a pardon board to advise him on, on applications. Even though there were thousands. Can we step back for a second? I, I know one of the things that you guys talk about, and one of the things I, as a viewer, a multi-time viewer think about is what's the impact on the show that captured everybody's attention on the big issues about criminal justice and do people watch this and say well uh, or some people say Avery and Dassey were done wrong or maybe they don't or do they step back and say Avery and Dassey are representative of what's wrong with our criminal justice system I know you hope it's the latter but why do you think it's the latter? Yeah. Well I, th I think people fall into 
into two camps, at least on that. Um, but of those who are able to take a concrete story and then think more abstractly from there um, about the broader run of cases or what sort of problems you see in one case that might recur in thousands of cases, I hope that's a larger group of people. And it's not just making a murderer, of course, that has provided these really compelling concrete stories. It's Serial, the podcast. It's The Staircase. Uh, very recently, mm -hmm. it's the adaptation of John Grisham's mm -hmm. The Innocent Man um, and any number of others, not just in this country, but in others. Um, there's a, a great podcast in Western Ireland right now about a, 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 a very fascinating and problematic conviction there. And so I, I do think that there are a number of available true crime treatments that are responsibly done and that can provoke the larger conversation that we hope will engage people. I hope that's true, but I, you know, when I was watching this, I always kept saying to myself, why do people care about Stephen Avery? I can understand why they cared about Dassey, by the way, because of uh, well, his developmental yeah, disabilities he's thing. He's a more and, sympathetic character. And that now. confession yeah. thing is just, it, the whole thing is appalling, whether you're a lawyer or just playing one on TV. But why did people care about Avery. I mean, I I worried that it was almost like a game. It was like a almost like a you know it was like a CSI. It was like a show mm -hmm. as opposed to a real life thing. Why did they care about this? You guy? know, I, I think it, his experience of being wrongly convicted and um, under the first, round. The first time, uh, were 18 years in prison, and and then the circumstances looking like he was framed for that with withheld evidence that pointed to the real killer all along that was never told to the defense. I think that made people sympathetic. Um, you know, he's also, um, uh, you know, I think they also saw how they used Brendan Dassey's confession against him to, yeah. to undermine his case. And, and there's no question that that woke up a lot of people about the kind of interrogation and, and look, techniques they used. Stephen Avery, at least for white Americans, um, is sort of an everyman in some ways. I mean, he... He's got he was a black everyman. Would anybody have cared about making a murder? I, I I think this wouldn't have had the same breadth of impact. I really do. I hate to say that, but I, I think that's right. Had this story occurred in a in a big city, uh, or with a defendant who was a person of color, I'm not sure it would have had the same impact. The, the reason you guys were in town is uh, uh, this time is to be preaching your criminal justice uh, reform thing. Briefly, if you can, Jerry, what's at the top of that list where you think that we could have a fairer system, where people did get a fair shake, while at the same time, people that want to be secure felt secure in their houses and their communities? What, what's that thing? Well, certainly the, the interrogation techniques that are used all over the country every day, particularly on juveniles and vulnerable adults, is, is right up there at the top of the list. But also, uh, you know, they've done studies of the exoneration cases now, and somewhere in the neighborhood of 25% of those um, known false convictions, um, false or misleading forensic science, so-called science, played a big role. And, you know, whether it's junk science that, that's been introduced for, for decades in this country, like hair comparison, uh, mm -hmm. bite mark comparison, a lot of the comparison type testimony, tire marks, um, uh, you know, that's been a serious problem. And what, it, it, you know, it, there was just criminal justice reform, imperfect as it may have been, and the federal government actually signed by the President of the United States. Is there something on the list of what you talk about that you can imagine a Republican and Democratic leadership agreeing upon and Donald Trump signing? Dean? It's easier for me to imagine reducing the consequences of mistakes mm -hmm. than addressing the fundamental because of the cost causes of, yes. of the mistakes. Because of the cost uh, yeah. attendant right. to that. Right. So even if you don't care about the individual, you care about the bottom line. That's right. And, and uh, you know, there is, I think, widespread recognition that we have a, a problem with mass incarceration in this country, that it's racially tinged or worse. Uh, and that it's terribly expensive, both in the direct outlay for taxpayers and in the indirect costs of devastated communities and families. But, but you know, the, the federal system is only about 10 percent of the criminal mm -hmm. justice system. Ninety percent is that. in the states. Yeah. And, uh, you know, reforms have continued um, in places where you might not think that would like be likely, where, like, like Texas. Texas, when it comes to forensic science reform, is leading the country, believe it or not. 
Um, they've got real scientists on a commission that, that are reviewing cases and reviewing the techniques and, and uh, arguing that they should, should not be used in court. And, and, um, and so other states are starting to follow suit as well. Um, Texas has, has you know, reduced their incarceration rate steadily over the last five, six years. Wisconsin, on the other hand, where you might think that this is traditionally a progressive state, is at the all-time high of incarceration, and they're talking about building a new prison. Now, that may all change with the, with the new leadership, um, but it just goes to show you that, that you can't just assume that, that um, you know, it's a, it's a red versus blue issue. Well, there's proof of that here, as I've mentioned to you guys before, amongst the lowest paid states for public defenders and for prosecutors uh, in America is the bl very blue state right. of Massachusetts. So I hope you guys keep doing it. It's great to see you again. Thanks so much. Thanks for having us back. Jerry, great, great to you see again. you. Really appreciate okay. it. Okay. You can also visit the Center for Integrity and Forensic Sciences website for more on Dean and Jerry's efforts at CIFSjustice.org. But before we move on, there's one more mystery from the second season of Making a Murder that still hasn't been solved. You can see it in this clip from the first episode. The things that seem to outrage people and the, the, the questions that we've gotten are things that Dean and I have talked about for years. Where on earth is that eyebrow going?